So this is the fourth lecture of uh, section one, and it's the beginning of chapter three, where we're looking at the um, micro level of the nervous system. Uh, I'm gonna let you watch this video. It's actually a good quick synopsis about what we know and what we don't know about the nervous system. So I'll leave you go click on that through your uh, PDF. What do we know about the inner workings of the human mind? Surely everything that humans do from designing skyscrapers to composing symphonies is not the product of simple cellular interactions. And yet it might be. Because everything that humans do or think or feel is a result of these basic units of brain structure, the neurons. The human brain contains more than 100 billion neurons. Just like a single ant could never build an anthill, a single neuron can't think or feel or remember. A neuron's power is a result of its connections to other neurons. Each neuron is connected to as many as a thousand of its neighbors. These trillions of connections provide the playing field upon which the complex activity of the brain takes place. Each neuron can turn its neighbors on or off depending on the signal it sends and the resulting stable patterns of neuron firing represents memories and images and thoughts. We don't yet understand the relationship between neural activity and mental experience. We don't know what the precise pattern of memory or an image or a thought looks like. We don't yet know how to read the cerebral code of the neurons, but progress is being made. We can now watch exactly how various stimuli and memories cause the firing of hundreds of neurons. Perhaps these techniques will allow us to work our way up from the activity of a few neurons to see the structure that emerges from the whole. This morning was a typical morning for me. I woke up thinking about that dream that I keep having about the guy in the sloth suit, and then I got dressed because I was cold, and then I made some toast with butter because I was hungry, and then I let the dog out because she was whining and staring at me, and then I made some tea, but I let it cool off before I drank it because it burned my mouth yesterday. In addition to being just part of my morning ritual, all of these actions are examples of what my nervous system does for me. The weirdo dream, the sensation of cold air and hot tea, deciding what to put on the toast, going to the door, the sound of the dog, all that was processed and executed by electrical and chemical signals to and from nerve cells. You can't oversell the importance of the nervous system. It controls all the things. All your organs, all your physiological and psychological reactions, even your body's other major controlling force, the endocrine system, bows down before the nervous system. There is no you without it. There's no me without it. There's no dogs without it. There's no animals. There's no, there's no things, there's things. It's important, that's why we're dedicating the next several episodes to the fundamentals of the nervous system. Its anatomy and organization, how it communicates, and what happens when it gets damaged. This is Mission Control, people. pretty much all animals, except super simple ones like sponges, have a nervous system, ours is probably the most distinctive feature of our species. From writing novels, to debating time travel, to juggling knives, all of your thoughts and actions and emotions can be boiled down into three principal functions. Sensory input, integration, and motor output. Imagine a spider walking onto your bare knee. The sensory receptors on your skin detect those eight little legs. That information is your sensory input. From there, your nervous system processes that input and decides what should be done about it. That's called integration. Like, should I be all zen about it and just let it walk over me? Or should I not be zen and freak out and run around screaming? Spider! Your hand lashing out to remove the spider and maybe your accompanying banshee scream is the motor output. The response that occurs when your nervous system activates certain parts of your body. As you can imagine, it takes a highly integrated system to detect, process, and act on data like this all the time. And when we talk about the nervous system, we're really talking about several levels of organization. Starting with two main parts, the central and peripheral nervous systems. The central nervous system is your brain and spinal cord, the main control center. It's what decided to remove the 
spider and gave the order to your hand. Your peripheral nervous system is composed of all the nerves that branch off from the brain and spine that allow your central nervous system to communicate with the rest of your body. And since its job is communication, your peripheral system is set up to work in both directions. The sensory, or afferent division, is what picks up sensory stimuli, like, hey, there's an arachnid on you, and slings that information to the brain. Your motor, or efferent division, is the part that sends directions from your brain to the muscles and glands, like, hey, hand part, how about you do something about that spider? The motor division also includes the somatic, or voluntary nervous system that rules your skeletal muscle movement, and the autonomic, or involuntary nervous system that keeps your heart beating and your lungs breathing and your stomach churning. And finally, that autonomic system, too, has its own complementary forces. Its sympathetic division mobilizes the body into action and gets it all fired up like, ah, spider! While the parasympathetic division relaxes the body and talks it down, like, it wasn't a black widow or anything, you're fine, breathe. So that's the organization of your nervous system in a nutshell. But no matter what part you're talking about, they're all made up of mainly nervous tissue, which you'll remember is densely packed with cells. Maybe less than 20% of that tissue consists of extracellular space. Everything else? Cells. The type of cells you most likely heard of are the neurons, or nerve cells, which respond to stimuli and transmit signals. These cells get all the publicity. They're the ones we're always thanking every time we ace an exam or think up a snappy comeback to an argument. But these wise guys really account for just a small part of your nervous tissue because they are surrounded and protected by gaggles of neuroglia, or glial cells. Once considered just the scaffolding or glue that held neurons together, we now know that our different glial cell types serve many other important functions functions, and they make up about half of the mass of your brain, outnumbering their neuron colleagues by about 10 to 1. Star-shaped astrocytes are found in your central nervous system and are your most abundant and versatile glial cells. They anchor neurons to their blood supply and govern the exchange of materials between neurons and capillaries. Also in your central nervous system are your protective microglial cells. They're smaller and kind of thorny looking and act as the main source of immune defense against invading microorganisms in the brain and spinal cord. Your ependymal cells line cavities in your brain and spinal cord, and create, secrete, and circulate cerebrospinal fluid that fills those cavities and cushions those organs. And finally, your central nervous system's oligodendrocytes wrap around neurons, producing an insulating barrier called the myelin sheath. Now, over in your peripheral nervous system, there are just two kinds of glial cells. Satellite cells do mainly in the peripheral system what astrocyte cells do in the central system. They surround and support neuron cell bodies, while Schwann cells are similar to your oligodendrocytes in that they wrap around axons and make that insulating myelin sheath. So don't sell your glial cells short. They're in the majority cell-wise, but of course when it comes to passing tests and winning arguments, most of the heavy lifting is done by the neurons. And they're not all the same. They're actually highly specialized, coming in all shapes and sizes, from tiny ones in your brain to the ones that run the entire length of your leg. But they do all share three super cool things in common. Number one, they're some of the longest lived cells in your body. There's a lot of debate right now about whether whether you're actually born with all the neurons you'll ever have, but some research suggests that at least in your brain's cerebral cortex, your neurons will live as long as you do. Cool fact number two, they are irreplaceable. It's a good thing that they have such longevity because your neurons aren't like your constantly renewing skin cells. Most neurons are amitotic, so once they take on their given roles in the nervous system, they lose their ability to divide. So. Take care of them. And number three, they have huge appetites. Like a soccer-playing teenager, neurons have a crazy high metabolic rate. They need a steady and abundant supply of glucose and oxygen, and about 25% of the calories that you take in every day are consumed by your brain's activity. Along with all these wonderful qualities, your neurons also share the same basic structure. The soma, or cell body, is the neuron's life support. It's got all the normal cell goodies, like a nucleus, DNA, mitochondria, ribosomes, cytoplasm. The bushy branch-like things projecting out from the soma are dendrites. They're the listeners. They pick up messages, news, gossip from other cells, and convey that information to the cell body. The neuron's axon, meanwhile, is like the talker. This long extension or fiber can be super short or run a full meter from your spine down to your ankle. We've got a few different axon layouts in our body, but in the most abundant type of neuron, the axons transmit electrical impulses away from the cell body to other cells. For us students of biology, it's a good thing that nerve cells aren't all 
all identical because their differences in structure are one of the ways that we tell them apart and classify them. The main feature we look at is how many processes extend out from the cell body. A process, in this case, being a projecting part of an organic structure. 99% of all your neurons are multipolar neurons with three or more processes sticking out from the soma, including one axon and a bunch of dendrites. Bipolar neurons have two processes, an axon and a single dendrite, extending from opposite sides of the cell body. They're pretty rare, found only in a few special sensory places like the retina of your eye. Unipolar neurons, on the other hand, have just one process and are found mostly in your sensory receptors. So if you ever find yourself probing around someone's nervous tissue, remember these three terms to help you figure out what you're looking at. But because we're talking about physiology here as well as anatomy, we have to classify these cells in terms of their function. And that basically comes down to which way an impulse travels through a neuron in relation to the brain and spine. Our sensory, or afferent neurons, pick up messages and transmit impulses from sensory receptors in, say, the skin or internal organs, and send them toward the central nervous system. Most sensory neurons are unipolar. Motor, or efferent neurons, do the opposite. They're mostly multipolar and transmit impulses away from the central nervous system and out to your body's muscles and glands. And then there are interneurons, or association neurons, which live in the central nervous system and transmit impulses between those sensory and motor neurons. Interneurons are the most abundant of your body's neurons and are mostly multipolar. Okay, it's applied knowledge time. Let's review everything we've learned so far in terms of that spider on your knee. Those eight creeping legs first activate your unipolar sensory neurons in the skin on your knee when they sense something crawling on you. The signal travels up an axon wrapped in Schwann cells and into your spinal cord where it gets passed on to several multipolar interneurons. Now, some of those interneurons might send a signal straight down a bunch of multipolar neurons to your quadriceps muscle on your thigh, triggering you to kick your leg out before you even know what's going on. Other interneurons will pass that signal to neurons that carry it up your spinal cord to your brain. That's where your body first recognizes that thing as a spider, and the connections between neurons interpret and split the signal so that you can either scream and start swinging your arms wildly about, or remain calm and with dignity remove the spider from your person. It's all based on the connections between neurons, which brings me to a whole new question. How? How in the name of Jean-Martin Charcot do nerve cells use chemistry and electricity to communicate with each other? It's one of the most stupefyingly awesome and complicated aspects of your nervous system and basically of all life, and it is what we will cover in our next lesson. Today, you learned how sensory input integration and motor output of your nervous system basically rules your world. We talked about how the central and peripheral systems are organized and what they do, and looked at the role of different glial cells and nervous tissue function. We all we also looked at the role, anatomy, and function of neuron types in the body, both structurally and functionally, and how everything plays out when you find a spider crawling on your skin. Thank you for watching, especially to all of our subbable subscribers who make Crash Course possible for themselves and for the whole rest of the world. To find out how you can become a supporter, just go to subbable.com. This episode was written by Kathleen Yale, the script was edited by Blake DiPestino, and our consultant is Dr. Brandon Jackson. It was directed by Nicholas Jenkins and Michael Aranda, and our graphics team is Thought Cafe. The basic unit that was discussed was the neuron, and that is the part of the nervous system that does the majority of the work with regards to firing and um, creating what we believe is like thought and um, those types of things. And it can be broken down into three different parts. The first part is uh, the dendrites, and this is the area of the neuron that receives information from its surrounding um, neurons. Then there's the cell body, which is the part that contains the nucleus, and if you've taken a micro uh, cellular micro biology class. Uh, neurons are just like every other cell in that they have uh, all the organelles, they have uh, the axon, they have exosomes, uh, uh, endoplasmic reticulum, uh, Golgi apparatus, all those types of things. So a neuron is similar to cells, but it has a highly fun highly specialized function. And the last part of a neuron uh, is the axon, which for this class, we're really only going to, I'm really only going to expect you to understand that there's one axon that leads a neuron. Uh, but please recognize that this is, um, as you're getting your segue into the nervous system, uh, we use it as a more simplistic view and recognize though that in reality what's actually happening in your brain is much more complex than that. So there are sensory uh, neurons which their job is to bring information into the nervous system. So that's arriving information that would be afferent, just touching back on some terminology. Uh, then there are motor neurons which uh, send information out of the nervous system, exiting or efferent. Uh, and you can see that they are designed differently. Uh, but one of the things you can 
see it across these two, a similarity is that the dendrites often uh, are highly branched uh, and that they are connected to, have the ability to be connected to more than one uh, source stimuli or other neuron. The last neurons that exist are interneurons, and these are neurons that go in between other neurons. Depending on where they're located, they may look very unique. Uh, and I'm not, again, I'm not expecting you to memorize these and be able to tell me which part of the brain they're in, but I want you to see that the the variety and um, the uniqueness of the dendrites based on where their job is and what they're doing in, in the brain uh, and how well they need to be connected, right? So if we think about the cerebellum, if you go back to uh, last lecture, we talked about how this is responsible for motor coordination and balance and those types of things. Look how interconnected these um, Purkinje cells or these neurons are uh, with other stimuli and, and how much information it's pulling in. And, and this is what's required for um, those neurons to do their job. As the video mentioned, there are really only two messages that a neuron can say. There's excitation and inhibition. Um, this is a you know zero one kind of um, like computer code. It basically um, that, that it's it's that simple. At least is our understanding right now is that that is how neurons talk. And, and but what's interesting is that the neurons are actually receiving inputs from lots of other neurons. And these the summation of all of these goes and stops or excitation or inhibition are what actually. Um, converge on that neuron and then it will act accordingly, whether it becomes active and sends a message or it does not. So different types of glial cells. We talked about neurons. Those are one type of nervous uh, system tissue or cell, excuse me. And uh, But there are support cells that you should um, get comfortable with because they'll be coming up at different times. The first one is um, the epididymal cell and we won't spend a ton of time talking about it, but its primary role is um, cerebral spinal fluid. And then the next four are actually pretty important. Uh, we will touch back with them at different times, so you should really you know, get comfortable with what these are. Uh, so this star-shaped is the astrocyte. The um, next one down here is the is connected to the immune system. So again, this is one that I love. It's called microglia. Uh, and then the last two are actually connected. Uh, they both perform the same job, and that's to create myelin. Uh, and when you're talking about they're having two different names, it's only because they're located in different parts of the nervous system. So the first one, the top one here, is responsible for, for creating myelin in the central nervous system, where the second one here is responsible for creating myelin in the periphery. Uh, and they respectively go by um, oleodendrocytes and CNS and Schwann cells in the periphery. Astrocytes were once thought to really only provide uh, structural support. So think about when you look at a house, you've got the beams or any building, you've got the beams um, and that hold the floor in place, hold the walls in place, that type of thing. That's what astrocytes are really believed to only be responsible for just even, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, but we've found out a lot more since then, and uh, it turns out that astrocytes play lots of roles. One is structural, one is uh, in supporting um, the blood-brain barrier, which is what these um, little pseudopods or feet of the astrocytes are doing is they're actually putting pressure, structural pressure, physical pressure on the blood vessel, which is what this red tube is here, which forces the um, small gaps that would be present between the cells to basically be disappeared, creating a very physical barrier called the blood-brain barrier. Uh, but today we know that astrocytes play a major role in um, creating neurotransmitters and um, helping absorb neuromodulators and neurotransmitters out of the synapse uh, to help facilitate basically healthy neurotransmission. What, how does myelin help and, and why do we have it? One is it speeds up conduction and we'll talk about, uh, it speeds up the action potential down the axon and we'll talk about that. But the other one we have found is that it plays a role when an axon or a neuron gets injured and it's damaged, um, that the Schwann cells, which may not be damaged, will actually um, remain there and replicate and provide and create growth factors that the axon will follow uh, and then regrow and then the myelin wraps it again and the neurons functional again. So this is something that we see happening and it's, it's kind of cool. Here are some examples just to give you an idea of, of how neurodegeneration occurs or what it looks like. Uh, so here's an example of Alzheimer's, which is a um, you know, neurodegenerative disease that usually affects elderly individuals um, where the brain actually starts to shrink and you can see it physically is um, wasting away. Uh, this is a picture of a brain from a um, stroke victim. You can see the damage over here on uh, the right side of the photo where there is loss of neuronal tissue and damage and uh, scar tissue that, affirm, that was uh, formed. And then here you can see the um, a picture which is not often visualized, especially early on with dementia, but as it becomes more progressive, they, um, the MRI is able to actually capture 
the degeneration of the brain and its inability, um, basically the loss of myelin here is what we're seeing because it's becoming more cell bodies and it's shriveling up. Uh, so again, those are just things you can see degeneration. All right, so as I mentioned, the neuron is a functional animal cell. Uh, it plays, it has all the different structures that, that um, every other cell in our body has minus red blood cells. Um, so be comfortable with what those different things do. And when we're talking about the neuron, it also has a cell membrane, and it's actually a very important piece of maintaining neurotransmission, and we'll talk about this as we get more in depth in the within communication. The cell membrane is made up of the phospholipid bilayer, and this is done with because of the polarity of the cells that make up the layers. And you have this hydrophilic end, which means it's water loving and it likes to be facing out towards the um, liquid that is outside the cell or uh, the liquid that's on the inside of the cell. And these tails right here are hydrophobic, meaning that they don't like water and they face each other. And that's how this membrane is created and is structurally sound. This membrane is semi-permeable, which means that only small or only certain things can actually get through um, the membrane and that there needs to be other ways to get around what we call this gatekeeper or semi-permeable membrane. How do we do that? So there are a couple different ways. There's an ion channel that is just always open. Um, there are gated channels, which are ones that are responsive to either a neurotransmitter or changes in polarity, and there are also pumps. Um, so we will talk about all three of these when we get to the discussion of the action potential. Again, the nucleus is important for creating and driving all protein synthesis in uh, the nucleus. This is a picture just walking you through the different steps of how you get from your DNA all the way to a protein. Once the protein is created, it then has to get packaged and delivered to wherever it goes. And this is um, an example of how pictorially or character in a character characteristic way how this information happens. So those little purple dots are neurotransmitters that are created in the nucleus and then have to be packaged and sent down to the axon uh, terminal to actually be released and be functional. And we have to do a quick chemistry review because this is important when we talk about polarity, uh, which is coming up soon. Um, when we, when you think about chemistry, general chemistry, uh, one of the things that we are aware of is that the that stability for an ion um, or stability for an element is actually driven by what the outer ring looks like. Um, so I'm taking it way back, right? So here's your um, protons and neutrons, here are your electrons around the, uh, the, the atom. Um, and one of the things that is, is true is that we need, they, they seek stability, and stability is having that outside ring be complete. And complete uh, on every ring besides the first one, uh, that means having eight electrons in it. Uh, and when we look at these different ones, can you tell whether or not a atom likes to give away or likes to take on an ion. Here's some examples. So again, outer ring likes to be stable. So chloride has seven naturally in its outer ring. It will gladly take on someone's free electron and then make its outer ring complete. Sodium, on the other hand, has one in its outer ring right here, and it will gladly give that away so it can reach stability. And this is why you often see chloride as an ion with a minus one and why you see sodium as an ion as plus one. And the big ones that play a role in um, neurotransmission include the, uh, the ones that I just highlighted. So calcium is often a plus two. As you can see, it's got two uh, electrons in its outer ring, so it will gladly give those away. Um, and then sodium, excuse me, sodium and potassium are plus one, gladly get rid of that. And chloride is often a negative one where it will, gladly, will, it will often take on a uh, electron to complete its outer ring. Now I'm going to walk through some principles that are important as we're talking about the nervous system and how it eventually ends up creating or affecting behavior. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on these because you can read about these in the textbook, but I do want to hit on them because they are important in, uh, as we continue on in our thinking and the way that we are processing the information we are learning. The brain brings in information from the outside world and creates a perception of it, right? There's a there's sensation of perception, which we'll get into in section two, but there is a world, right, that is out there, that is um, physically out there. But our eyes and our sense of smell or taste or touch is bringing that information in um, and creating our own, basically, perception of the world. And this is um, one of the things that was very interesting to think about is that each one of us, even if we are sitting in the same exact room and have the same exact experience, 
due to our past experiences, um, due to the way we were brought up and the environment in which we were trained to place our attention when we're sitting in a room with other people, um, all of those things have an impact on driving what actually we see as happening as the truth of that situation. Uh, another reason why um, eyewitness accounts are really un, um, really unreliable is because everybody's processing the world through their lens, and sometimes that lens is very different than reality. Um, all right, so the brain creates this perceptual world, and then the nervous system creates behavior to allow us to adapt and, and deal with the, the world that we see. Um, looking at the idea is that the nervous system is never ever static. Um, even in older age, the, the nervous system is changing and it, the synapses are, are, um, are connecting with new neurons and other ones are breaking it down. And there's this, ner what this concept is called neuroplasticity and we'll talk about that as, as time goes on. Brain circuitry, although we talk about it as being very simplistic and one axon talking to another. Uh, dendrite, the reality is that brain circuits are highly complex. Um, there are, uh, there's contralateral control, which means that one side of our brain, our right side of our brain controls the left side of our body where um, the, or the information that's coming in on the right side of our body, the left side of our brain is processing. Again, information as it's coming in is being processed on multiple levels. There are quick reflex responses, but then there are also opportunities for the brain to inhibit those and reinsert um, the appropriate response um, given the situation because the brain is processing and bringing in more information. The brain is both symmetrical and asymmetrical. I know that sounds kind of convoluted, but um, the when we look at it in a very uh, anatomical way, the brain and the hemispheres look similar. You have a right amygdala and a left amygdala. You have a right thalamus right and a left thalamus. Um, you have a left temporal lobe, right temporal lobe. So there are very, they're mirror images of each other. However, when we study and understand the jobs of those differing portions, um, we recognize that our brains have specialized certain areas to be responsible for particular behaviors and particular processing. We'll get into that. Again, there is a lot of um, complexity in our nervous system where systems run hierarchically, but they also run in parallel. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we have a really hard time understanding how the brain works and, and will um, create in a very difficult, um, it's creating a very difficult understanding for us as we're trying to, to gain an understanding of what's actually happening in our brain and our nervous system as it communicates. There are two primary divisions of the nervous system. There is information coming in, which is sensory, and information going out, which is motor. Um, the sensory input is divided in, up into figuring out what the object is, and then um, motor is then controlling our interaction with it, and we'll talk about this as we get to uh, somatosensory and movement. Now the brain um, has, as it's functioning and as, as it's processing, we do recognize that there are places that certain functions are very localized. However, for that localized functioning to occur, we recognize the importance of large uh, of multiple areas of the other parts of the brain that feed into that area. For example, the amygdala is one of those areas that lots of people are familiar with because of the role with emotion and fear and anger. Um, and this area, not only is it that, it is true, it is very localized in that area and, and fear. When you are just determining um, or deciphering a situation and, and coin it as fearful, the amygdala is on fire. Um, but the information for the amygdala to make that determination can't get there unless your eyes aren't bringing in the information, your hearing isn't bringing in the sounds, um, and then it feeds back to other areas of the brain to let it know, hey, we need to have a stress response. Um, and then the stress response happens and then that feeds back to the amygdala to support um, memory and coding of the stressful event. So there's there's all of these different things that go on. Um, one of the things we also see is that, um, and this kind of goes with this localization and distribution, is that for us to lose complete functionality of something, there has to be a massive brain damage. Um, very small uh, issues do not often, or can often actually go on uh, asymptomatically, which means there's no symptoms of it. Um, there's research that has suggested that as we age, we actually have microstrokes in our brain, but because these microstrokes are happening in such random areas of our brain, it, and it's not um, critical to survival or function of you know hearing or seeing or moving, um, that type of area. They're in other areas in the you know prefrontal cortex or uh, in the temporal lobes, those types of things. Um, what, the, because they're in those areas, there is actually no, uh, we don't even know that they're happening. Um, and, and that they actually, and, you know, as we age, they increase in, in um, 
currents um, and they've seen this in brains of people who have donated their um, bodies to science and then are investigated and, and studied. Um, and they see that there are old ones that they can detect, you know, from years ago, as well as newer ones that are occurring. And it seems like the frequency increases as we age. So it's an interesting thing to think about. Again, the nervous system, and this is the final principle, and we're gonna drive this home as we get into neurotransmission. There are only two messages that a neuron can send, and that is go, excitation or stop, which is inhibition. Um, and that's really it. Um, so what happens is that nervous system communication is so complex because it's not just receiving one message, it's receiving up to thousands and possibly even tens of thousands of messages, uh, depending on how important that neuron is and how connected it is. Uh, and that's where um, the difficulties um, come up when we're trying to understand. Uh, as also, our technology doesn't have the ability to actually look at um, the efficiency of the nervous system at the level that it's actually producing uh, behavior and um, thoughts. Right. And just to finish up for this, uh, I think you guys would love to watch this video. It, it talks about a woman's experience um, with actually brain inflammation that looked like mental health uh, issues. So the top uh, link is a longer one that um, is actually a TED Talk, and then the Brain on Fire is a shorter version of that if you don't have time to watch the full long one. But both are very good and provide insight into um, how little we know about the brain. Four years ago, I was a very different Susanna. I was a deranged Susanna. I was a Susanna who saw things that weren't there. And I actually have video evidence of this person as well. I'd like to show you. Can I help you? Yeah, yeah, okay. Ma'am, lady, ma'am? Yeah, I That's because I actually saw myself on the news. I saw a sea of paparazzi outside of my hospital room waiting to interview me. I thought nurses were spying on me, taking notes about me. But all of this, all of it, all of it was in my head. At other points, I became so certain that people were trying to persecute me, people were trying to hurt me, that I ripped out EV, e, uh, IV out of my arm and ran screaming up and down the hallways until a nurse tackled me and I bit and punched her. Just, I was in a survival mode. You know, if you take all these into account, this kind of persecution complex, the delusions, the hallucinations, you think, this is someone who's suffering from a psychiatric condition. In fact, I have the diagnostic criteria, at least some of them, for, for schizophrenia. I'd like to read them to you. Schizophrenia involves two or more of the following. Delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech. At the time, I could hardly string together a sentence, a logical sentence. The onset typically occurs in late teens or early 20s, sometimes later in women. I was 24 at the time, fit the bill. To the untrained eye, to someone who was unaccustomed to dealing with what actually was happening, I fit the bill for schizophrenia, but I did not have a psychiatric condition, nor did I have schizophrenia. I was not insane in that traditional sense of the word. It all started about a month before this hospital scene. I was working as a journalist, and I noticed I couldn't concentrate on my interviews. I, someone would speak, and I, and I couldn't translate the words in, onto the paper. From there, I became moody, emotional. One second, I'd be laughing hysterically, happiest I've ever felt. The next second, I was crying, and I couldn't stop it, and I couldn't explain it. It was just as if my emotions were taking control of me. Then, I had a seizure. The 
following night, I spent, the, I spent the night at my father's house. And there, while sitting in his living room, the paintings started to come alive. One of a railroad scene. In, in it, a, a train car started to emit tufts of smoke which came out of the frame. My dad had a bust of Abraham Lincoln, and it started to follow me with its sunken eyes. And then I heard a pounding. It was, it was an intense pound, pound, pound. It was the sound of my father's fists hitting my stepmother's face. I could hear it as clear as day. It was as real to me as anything that has ever happened to me. I ran screaming into the bathroom and nearly jumped out the window to escape my father. This was all in my head. None of this happened. Clearly, I needed, something needed to be happening here, and there was too much going on. So my parents decided she needs to be hospitalized, and she needs to be hospitalized now. But they were adamant that I not be placed in a psychiatric hospital. And that, I believe, saved my life. I spent the next month of my life at NYU Medical Center in Manhattan. And there, the delusions and the hallucinations got worse, as in this video. What I was seeing on TV was the belief that my father had actually killed my stepmother. That delusion followed me. It followed me for days. And I believed it so fully that I, I kicked him out of my room several times, screaming at him, kidnapper, kidnapper. I also believed that my dad was turning into people and playing tricks on me. Those are exact words I, I spoke to a doctor about. And I also believed that I had the ability to age people with my mind. I remember so vividly staring at one of my psychiatrists who had come to interview me. And I looked at her, and wrinkles formed all around her mouth and her eyes. And then I looked away, and suddenly she would grow younger and more radiant with every passing second. I, I had this gift, this gift of, of being able to age people with my mind. I mean, I, that's, that's where I was at that point. And, you know, on paper, I was normal. Besides these hallucinations and this delusion, I was a healthy 24-year-old. So the doctors couldn't help but say, we think this is psychiatric in nature. And when once again, my blood tests and my MRIs and all my scans came back normal, they diagnosed me with, with what's called schizoaffective disorder. And that is, in short, the combination of schizophrenic and bipolar features. So that's, that's where I was at that point. About three weeks into my hospital stay, though, a man named Dr. Suhel Najjar, a man who had earned a pretty solid reputation as a renegade, as an out-of-the-box thinker, as someone that you'd bring someone to when, when nothing made sense, when a, case, when a case just didn't make sense, he was the man people took their patients to. He came in the room, interviewed me at this point, I couldn't even really engage in a conversation. I had slid into a catat what's called a catatonic state, which is basically the absence of emotion, the absence of any kind of reaction. I, I left my arms out of these unnatural degree, you know, almost like mummy hands that I had. And I could, I could almost not even swallow liquids. I needed a little sippy cup. So this is, I was really deteriorating very fast. And he, he took one look at me and thought, not a psychiatric case. This is not a psychiatric case. And he interviewed my parents for about an hour. That was about four times as long as any other doctor had spent with us during that three weeks there. And he took three pages of handwritten notes. Three pages that not only chronicled the hallucinations and the paranoia, those robust, you know, very, very visible symptoms, but he also took into account the fact that I'd had seizures, the fact that I had numbness on one side of my body prior to the hospital stay. The fact that my heart rate was in flux, that it was fluctuating between too high and too low. All these factors went into his three-page write-up. And then he took, a, he took a look at me and thought, the clock test. Now, the clock test is typically given to stroke and Alzheimer's patients. It's not given to 24-year-old girls. But he did it anyway. He gave me a piece of paper and asked me to draw a clock. I don't remember a thing about this because my memory was so badly affected, but I'm told that I tried the circle twice. I had to do it twice because I couldn't do a circle the first time around. And then I began drawing the numbers on the clock. 
and I would perseverate, which is, like, which is concentrating on, a, on each number many times, drawing it many times. And when Dr. Najjar looked down at my page, he nearly applauded. I actually have the clock um, here. I had squished, as you can see, all the numbers on the right-hand side of the clock. This is how I'm seeing the world. I'm seeing the world not fully, because as he can tell from this clock, the right side of the brain, which is responsible for the left field of vision, i.e. the left side of the clock, was clearly impaired. I was neglecting that left side. So he, he, almost, he almost applauded because this was the proof he needed. No one with a psychiatric condition would draw a clock like that. This was his proof. He actually pulled my parents aside, took them outside my room, and said, her brain is on fire. He said, her brain is on fire, and the next step we need to do is we need to do a brain biopsy to confirm that what I believe is inflammation in her brain. So they went ahead, they did a brain biopsy, they did a, which is not fun, uh, they did a spinal tap, and, and they sent that spinal fluid to the one place in the world at the time that tested for the disease. The spinal tap came back very positive for inflammation, and the spinal fluid came back positive as well, and I finally got my diagnosis. I was the 217th person in the world to be diagnosed with a form of autoimmune encephalitis called anti-NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis, which is a long word, very complicated word, but it's, it's pretty easy to sum up. Basically, it's when your body's immune system begins to target and attack the NMDA receptors of the brain. The NMDA receptors of the brain are all over, but they're concentrated in high amounts in the hippocampus and the limbic system. So that's why you have something that affects learning, memory, and behavior, and also other functionings like breathing and swallowing as the, as the disease progresses. Now, this disease was only named or discovered in 2007. This happened to me in 2009. Four years, two years, sorry, two years, four years until, since I actually was diagnosed, but two years marks the difference between me standing here in front of you right now, talking to you, and me being in a psychiatric ward, in a nursing home, even, in, even dead. That's it. It's this thin, thin line that saved me. And luck saved me, too. What's amazing about this disease, what's the, probably, perhaps one of the most amazing things about a pretty amazing disease, is that if you catch this and you treat it, and the treatment's fairly simple. In my case, it was steroids and immune therapies. Pretty simple. That's it. I'm, I'm no longer on any of it. I, it. I was on it for a year. But with those therapies... 80% recover, 80% recover. That is an amazingly high figure considering how devastating, how utterly devastating the disease is at its height. If you would have seen me then, you wouldn't have recognized me. You would not have seen me at all in the shell that I was then. And I think about, I can't help but think about all those people out there throughout history who went undiagnosed, misdiagnosed, overlooked. I think about people who were put in psychiatric hospitals. I think about people who were given exorcisms. I can't help but think about all those people. And I think about how lucky I was, how extremely lucky I was to meet a man who thought outside the box. And my goal, I wrote a book about it, talking about it. My goal is to even the playing field. I want I really want everyone to be as lucky as I was. Thank you so much.